Okay. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Not too many people here. Maybe I uh, did I did I send out a an email? I'll send a blast right now. Does it still say that? Whoops. April Fools. <laughs> okay. Now that I sent that email, uh, I think I sent it. My email's acting weird. Um, well, like half of or more people are here. Oh. Okay, looks like the email worked. Maybe I'll give it a minute before I start. Um, and uh, take a couple more bites of my lunch that got here late. So I'll just, from last time, But R be a ring, uh, an ideal I <clears throat> is a subset, like a subgroup of R under addition, such that uh, <clears throat> I is closed under multiplication. And R I is contained in I, and I R is contained in I for all R in the ring. Uh, so that's just to remind you what an ideal is. And then also from last time, uh, we learned that um, Uh, basically, if I is an ideal, we can form the quotient ring R mod I, which is defined as the set of cosets. Where we define R plus I plus s plus i the same way we always would and the way that you would want to define <coughs> the product of two cosets is uh, what works and this is well defined if and th this is well defined if and only if um, stream is half covered oh thank you <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, what I have written down is uh, was uh, was already in the in the previous slides. So this should, if you were here last time, this should already be in your notes. Um, but so um, 
ideals are the type of subsets that um, that we can quotient out by. And um, so we have this first isomorphism theorem for rings. So let phi from R to S be a ring homomorphism. Then the image of phi, which is a subring of S, is isomorphic to R mod the kernel of phi. So this, <clears throat> we already showed that the kernel is an ideal. Okay, All right, an ideal of R, and the image is a subring of S. Okay, and I'm not going to really write out the proof of this, but uh, so you use. The same proof of the first isomorphism theorem for groups. <laughs> so you get a map uh, from which direction did it go? Probably from. Uh, R mod kernel of phi to the image of phi, which is a group homomorphism. And then this is just the step that the step that I will skip uh, that then show this is uh, actually a ring homomorphism. And uh, it's already a bijection. Uh, I mean, we can write isomorphism as we proved in the first isomorphism theorem for groups. So you're just using that same map and showing that it's actually a ring isomorphism, not just a uh, group isomorphism. So that means uh, you have to, so if it's already a group homomorphism, that just means you have to show um, <coughs> so if I call this map, I don't know what we called it, uh, capital fee, let's say. That's a little capital fee there. You want to show that uh, capital fee of, here, let me not try to cram this in. All right, so the, the map is phi of R plus kernel of phi equals phi of, uh, sorry, little phi of R and um, so before we showed this is well defined onto one onto and a group homomorphism so that so it's a group it defines a group isomorphism. So that's uh, from the proof of the first isomorphism theorem for groups, just using the additive structure here. So the stuff that's left to show is just that um, phi of one, which is uh, one plus kernel of phi, that's the 
multiplicative ide identity element. Um, this would be one R, I guess, is equal to one S. And that phi of R S plus kernel of phi equals, uh, well, it should be, I mean, phi of R plus kernel of phi times S plus kernel of phi, which this by definition is that, uh, and that that equals R uh, S. I mean, this is this is actually just a proof that it's multiplicative, right? Uh, and um, which is phi of times phi of S plus kernel of phi for all R and S. big R. Anyway, so actually this is, I mean, I guess I showed it because this is just true by the definition. Right, this is the identity, the multiplicative identity of R mod kernel of phi. And as long as we know, you know, there's a, a lot goes into the fact that since the kernel is an ideal, this multiplication is well defined, and this is how we define the multiplication, and so then it just sort of comes out automatically that uh, it's a that uh, it has the other property of being a ring homomorphism, that it uh, respects the multiplicative structure, phi of that times that is equal to phi of the first thing times phi of the second thing. Okay. So if you understand first isomorphism theorem for groups, there's very little to do to understand it for rings, I guess. You just have to understand that, like, the right uh, thing to look at instead of being a normal subgroup is being an ideal, that that's the condition that you need. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions about that? Now that um, more people are here, though it's still fewer people, I'll make sure to send an email out later today. Um, I'll just mention, I, I thought I sent an email about this before, but I don't know, I'm very scatterbrained. So I'll just mention that um, I added on Canvas uh, solutions to the last two homeworks today. That's, um, those should have been up sooner. So uh, they're up there now. Uh, and that should be helpful in studying for the exam on Monday night. Um, yeah. And uh, I said I was going to add another video, and I didn't do that yet. Uh, whatever I would have put in there, you know, is not um, something I expect you to know, obviously, yet. Um, yeah, I so today I want to get into a little bit more of stuff from 7.3 and a little bit in 7.4 because it gives me a lot of examples of sort of general ring things that I can prove that give sort of that have short proofs. Um, if you just, they're just sort of a matter of processing various definitions, and it gives some good examples of the types of basic proofs uh, about rings that you can do. Um, in other words, you know, I'm, I'm not going to put too much on the exam about rings, but I want to put one or two questions, um, just making sure you can understand the definitions, and I'll, I'll put those definitions on the uh, little definition sheet that I share with you. Anyway, so I want to get a little bit into 7.4, hopefully, today. Um, let's see. 
Uh, but actually, first, uh, let's see. Um, I wanted to show an interesting. Uh, example of a ring homomorphism. So uh, let's let R be Z mod PZ, where P is prime. And of course, now we can actually understand. So, so this is the set. Uh, Right, it's a it's the set zero bar one bar two bar up to p minus one bar. Right, so um, under addition, it's a cyclic group of order p, and every element other than uh, so it's actually a field um, because every element other than zero actually has an inverse under multiplication. <laughs> but this is the reason we use this notation. This is actually the quotient of Z by the ideal PZ, which is, right, uh, PZ is literally the set PX such that X is in Z. So it's the set of integers that are mul multiples of P, including zero. So that's like the kernel here uh, of the map from Z to this. Uh, everything that's a multiple of P we associate with zero. Everything that is in, looks like one plus a multiple of P goes here, etc. Right. So that that's an example of a quotient, uh, and this is an example of an ideal. But um, here's a, there's an interesting. define uh, an interesting homomorphism from R to R can define F from, uh, well, let me just write from R to R by F of X equals X to the P and a claim is that uh, this is a ring homomorphism. Okay, so uh, I want to show a few things. So f of one bar, one bar is the identity element with, for multiplication, is one bar to the p, which is one to the p bar, which is just one bar. So, so showing the, the properties of being a ring homomorphism, one is that it has to send the multiplicative identity to the multiplicative identity. Uh, and yeah, one to the P is one. Like that, that's not surprising. Um, so if X and Y are in R, I mean, you can sort of be lazy and not write the bar. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sort of stop writing the bar. Um, everything is mod P here, right? Uh, F of XY is XY to the P, which is XY, XY. x, y, x, y, p times. Um, and since this multiplication is commutative, this is an example of a commutative ring. Uh, I can just reorder this. So this is x to the p, y to the p, which is f of x, f of y. So I get the, uh, the multiplicative uh, homomorphism property. But uh, then the last thing is that I want to show that x, that f of x plus y is equal to f of x 
plus f of y. In other words, I want to show that x plus y to the p is equal to x to the p plus y to the p. And this has a colorful name uh, called the freshman's dream uh, for obvious reason that uh, a lot of times in basic math classes uh, people make this sort of algebra mistake which if these are like real numbers or something then as you well know x plus y to the p is not equal to x to the p plus y to the p right like that's not how powers work uh, that's not how algebra works right um, but uh, when you're working mod p it actually does work. So um, we need a little lemma. And the lemma is just uh, that let p be a prime number. Then if Uh, n is a number from 1 to p minus 1. Then p divides the binomial coefficient p choose n. Where I hope you know that p choose n is defined as p factorial divided by n factorial times p minus n factorial in this case. Just show of hands, who, who raise your hand on, on Blackboard if you were familiar with this notation and this definition here. And if there's no, no shame in not having seen that. I'm just curious. So raise your hand if you... Uh, or, or do you know how to make yourself confused? You can click on your face and you can say you're confused if you don't know. Let's see how, if you don't know, or if you're not familiar with that. At any rate, it's the number of subsets of 1 through p. Of size n. Uh, any, anyone with with their hand still up? If that you can put it down, or if you still have a question, you can leave it up. You you can always use the raise hand thing to ask a question. Okay. <clears throat> so, as a proof, um, clearly. The numerator is divisible by p here because it's p factorial. It's p times some other stuff. Uh, and the claim is just that the denominator is not. And I think that's also pretty easy to see because n and p minus n are both less than p. Since n uh, was at least 1 and at most p minus 1. So uh, these are the product of all the numbers less than some number that's less than, less than or equal to some number that's less than p in each of these factorials. And so they don't have any prime, they don't have the prime number p showing up uh, in any of the factors of what's down here. So that's it. So like this is some integer, which is an integer divided by another integer, and p goes into the top and p doesn't go into the bottom. So you have a p left over. Okay, that just sort of follows from like factoring uh, an integer into primes. Hopefully, so that's a little uh, number theory getting injected here. Uh, 
Okay. So then uh, x plus y to the p, right? It's uh, x plus y, x plus y, x plus y. Probably most people are familiar with the binomial theorem, but it's you're probably familiar with it like in R or in Z or something like that. I mean, this is just a theorem about any ring, really, uh, because... You know, when you multiply this out, you're just repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly using the distributive property. And you just end up getting x to the p. And then, like, there's a... Well, it's about commutative rings. So there, there's, like, how many different ways can I get x times y, which is the same as y times x, like, raised to different powers. So, like, uh, you get... You get... Uh, p choose 1 copies of uh, x to the p minus 1, y to the 1, and p choose 2 copies of x to the p minus 2, y squared, etc. So the, the like ith term is p choose i. I mean, well, here, let me just write, write down. Uh, so the last term, the last couple, so there's p minus 1. Uh, x, y to the p minus 1, and uh, y to the p, or it's, uh, you know, x to the p plus y to the p plus these middle terms are the sum from i equals 1 to p minus 1, uh, p choose i, x to the p minus i, y to the i. So this is the binomial theorem, which is just sort of a little bit of combinatorics, and uh, but hopefully something that you've seen. I mean, it's usually covered a little bit in calculus um, because it ge it's gives rise to some interesting power series uh, when you expand the idea of what these mean. Uh, anyway, <coughs> uh, these are all zero mod p, since they're all, uh, each one of these terms is multiplied by one of these uh, things that has a p in it. So when you're working, it, so this is like a bunch of integers, and these integers are all divisible by p, so they all go away. Okay, so that's uh, sort of starters on uh, the freshman's dream, which I, I think is amusing. Uh, <coughs> so now a very important homomorphism and an example of why the ring of integers z is a very important ring. If we let r be any ring, we can define phi from z to r by phi of n, so here n is an integer, is equal to 1 plus 1 plus 1 uh, n times. So for example, phi of 1 is 1, like this is 1r, right? And this is, uh, this is one, like the inputs are just integers, literally. So this is the integer one and the output is whatever the multiplicative identity is in the ring, right? Phi of zero 
is like defined to be zero. But it's like a sum with zero elements in it we usually take to be zero. That's like uh, V of two is one R plus one R. V of negative three, like what does it mean? It means uh, you add it negative three times. So it means the negative of one R plus the negative of one R plus the negative of one R, right? And I think it's pretty easy to show that this is a homomorphism, but uh, I'll just say that's an exercise. Show this is a ring homomorphism. But this is a, an important, so this is a homomorphism that exists for every ring. You can map Z to any ring, and it allows you, this allows us to uh, treat integers like elements of R by just identifying an integer with whatever. So like I can, I just have some arbitrary ring. I can think of negative three as being an element of the ring because I think of negative one as being an element of the ring because there's some multiplicative identity called one. It has an additive inverse called negative one. And I can add three copies of that. And that's the thing that I call negative three. Now, hypothetically, negative three and negative six could be the same element. Like, uh, this homomorphism doesn't have to be one to one. Okay. <clears throat> but now, uh, I could give, let me give a definition. Let R be a ring. The characteristic of R is the least positive integer n such that uh, one r plus one r plus n times in other words, the output of this function here uh, is equal to the zero element of the ring. And uh, if no such n exists, we say R has characteristic zero. You might think that you would say infinity, but, uh, and if, if you thought it would make more sense to call that infinity. So like, for example, um, if R is Z, the characteristic of R is zero. This is the notation char for characteristic. <laughs> Uh, is zero. Is there a name for phi? Uh, it's like the, the, the natural homomorphism from Z to R. I don't know if it has like a really standard name. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's like, I mean, it's so natural and common of a, for, for this, that sometimes you, you might see somebody just like, draw some diagram where they write like Z goes to R and they just assume everyone knows what map they mean because like if unless otherwise specified that's just this map that always exists. Um, it's so it's a it's a very ubiquitous thing and it's a, a reason why the integers are just a very very natural ring and they, they 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 have a relationship to every other ring. 
because of this homomorphism. Uh, so, I mean, this looks, it, it's, it's like, this definition is literally, it's the order of this element in the additive group. And if, so like in Z, this is, these are just ones and there's no multiple of one that equals zero, like a positive multiple of one, right? Like one has infinite order in the group Z, the additive group. So like it would really make sense to call this characteristic infinity, but people call it characteristic zero. <laughs> it's just what it's called. Uh, I don't have a super good um, reason for that. Maybe, maybe if I thought about it more, uh, I would remember why why that's a good name. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's it's lagging. The stream is a little choppy. Hmm. I'm not sure what I can do about that. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I can wait for a moment. Uh, You think it's working fine now? I hope so. There will be no lag in the video when I post it online. Uh, and I, again, I was great at remembering to hit record. Uh, seems like this was sort of cut off here. Anyway, um, okay. So, what page is this? Three or something? Yeah, question, Alex? Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, you say that, I, I think when you were talking about um, the characteristic, it cut out a little bit. Did you say it's analogous to order? Yeah, good question. So, so what, what the character literally, the characteristic, uh, is literally equal to, uh, so, so, uh, the characteristic of R that's, this is the notation for it. Sorry, I'm off the page. I know, uh, characteristic of R is equal to, um, the order of the element one R in the additive group. Right, so this is the multiplicative identity in the additive group, uh, right? Because this is the additive identity. So it's, it is literally the order of something. And the fact that it's the order of that, like, like if, if, if there's no positive integer such that when you add this enough times, you get back to zero, then you would say that element has infinite order. But uh, uh, so this is like, even though, it would make sense to call this infinity, we call it zero. I don't know. Uh, that's just, yeah, this isn't super important. Uh, we're not gonna actually talk about characteristic that much, but I just wanted to um, say a couple of, of things. So, uh, So one note, and maybe just think about this. I don't, I don't want to spend too much time saying this, but think about why this is true. Uh, so uh, the characteristic of R equals N is equivalent to saying that the kernel of the phi, uh, where phi is from above there. Ugh, sorry. Like phi goes from Z to R as above is equal to the ideal in Z, which means multiples of N. Okay, so it's sort of like identifying the kernel, right? The kernel is all the things that go to zero. 
Okay. And then the other thing that I'll just say is that um, if you look back, uh, you'll just notice that uh, f going from r to r defined by f of x equals x to the p, where p is prime. Uh, is a homomorphism whenever R is a ring of characteristic. Uh, this is a lowercase p. p. Uh, so this is just the, I did the example of the freshman's dream for the ring um, uh, uh, the ring Z mod PZ, uh, but it could be any uh, ring with this property that uh, that basically, I mean, what you need. So you see <coughs> what what's going on here. Uh, when you write out what the product of some things is, like what is this? What is this thing right here? This is an integer. But actually, so like let's say that integer was five. Okay. So what does five times something mean in a ring? It literally means add that thing to itself five times, right? Like, so this is, uh, I lost my, it's like when I said like, that you can think of, I'll just write on a piece of paper here. Right? So like, You can use phi to think of integers as elements of R, where R is any ring. So, like, what does 5x mean where x is an element? of just some arbitrary ring. It just literally, it means x plus x plus x plus x plus x. Since, uh, since it literally, literally means 1r plus 1r plus 1r plus 1r plus 1r five times times x and then you can just distribute that and you get that right so when you look at the proof of the freshman's dream thing we do this binomial thing so like for example like what does x plus y times x plus y mean just in some arbitrary ring it means x let's say in some commutative ring. So these are just some elements of a commutative ring. It means uh, x plus y times x plus x plus y times y, which is x squared plus y x plus x y plus y squared, which is x squared plus xy plus xy plus y squared. And like, how do, you know, I, I, I want to write this, I want to write xy plus xy as 2xy, right? Like, that's how I would normally write that. It's like, wait, does that make sense? What's 2? This is just some ring. It's like, uh, I know what two is. Two is the 
uh, I, the, it, two is one plus one, where one is the multiplicative identity of the ring. So two is a well-defined thing. And what it really is, is phi of two for that homomorphism. This, this is... Is this... I don't need to put this in uh, quotes. It's phi of two, where phi is that homomorphism. So like this kind of thing with the bin binomial theorem just still makes sense. Like that's just the example of P equals two, right? So like if, uh, if, the, if the ring had characteristic two, meaning that two is equal to zero, then this would just go away and we would get, oh, X plus Y squared is X squared plus Y squared. Cool. Question is why P X to the P minus I equals zero P is prime or characteristic R is P, right? So, um, so like for example here, if I'll just do this case here, if uh, the characteristic of R equals two, then two is equal to zero in the ring. That's what that means. Does that make sense? It, it literally, it means that, that the, that the, identity added to itself is equal to zero in that ring, which is true, for example, in Z mod 2Z. But there are other good examples, um, like, yeah, w we can talk about more examples, like another good example of a ring of characteristic two would be, well, here, just like another ring of characteristic P, where P is a prime number would be this ring Z mod PZ joint X, which which is equal to the set of polynomials in one variable called X with coefficients in Z mod PZ. So that is a ring. And in fact, in general, and this is actually uh, from 7.1 or two, I'm not sure which section it's in. It was one of the things I was planning to do in the video that I never got to recording yet. Uh, but, uh, this is just like a good example of a ring uh, is if you let R be just a ring and then you can do this R brackets X. The definition of it is polynomials in X with coefficients in R. Or in other words, it's things of the form A0 plus A1x plus A2x squared plus plus AKx to the K such that K is a non-negative integer and a zero through a k r and r and the addition and multiplication as usual meaning you know how to multiply you know how to add two polynomials and you know how to multiply two polynomials so you just do that and when you add two polynomials, you just add the corresponding coefficients. So that addition takes place in R for the coefficients. And when you multiply two, two polynomials, you have to like foil them uh, or you have to, you know, expand all that out. And what you get 
for each of your new coefficients is made out of sums of products of elements of the ring. And, and we have the ring has multiplication and addition. So, uh, and in fact, you can, you can have one variable or you could have polynomials in, you know, any number of variables. Uh, so those are called polynomial rings is a pretty important example of a ring. Um, yeah, okay, looks like we're out of time. I spent a lot of time talking about the freshman stream, which I think is a really fun uh, example. Um, yeah, look for an email from me later today uh, with some guidance about the exam. Um, please let me know if there's if you are anticipating any kind of issue with taking the exam at the normal time. The, the main thing I'll be needing of you, I'll, I'll be providing you at the start of it with the PDF file of the exam. I'd like you to just write down your answers to the questions that, uh, on you know clean piece of paper uh, as if it were a normal exam and just upload them to Canvas like we did for the quiz. Um, but uh, yeah, all right. Uh, anyway, lecture over. Any questions? <laughs> People want to ask questions, I'll still be here. Um, Oh, also, I'll, I'll I can uh, stay around for office hours. Um, I mean, I can I'll I'll stay around for a little while right now. Um, if anybody has questions, I mean, I don't know. Maybe people can uh, let me know. Uh, I'll I'll be pretty available uh, between now and the exam, including over the weekend. If people want to talk to me. Let me know, and I can I can have office hours over the weekend or whatever. Maybe I'll go ahead and pick a few times this weekend. Um, so yeah. Anyway, uh, Runze, did you have a question or somebody had a question? Yeah, uh, I have a question about the homework. Homework eight. Yeah, homework eight about question four. Okay, hold, just a second. Okay. I'll put it up so anybody who else who's here can see. Oh, what's this? Is any of these it? Question four, this one here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and in the me, well, hold on. This this question is simpler. Uh, Um, the example uh, from class of the automorphisms of a cyclic group. Cyclic group. Also a good thing to know. Okay. Um, okay, so you have a question about this uh, number four? Yeah, uh, what I think is that you want us to prove that if we suppose there exists another uh, normal subgroup called H, and we need to prove that uh, H intersect with AN is still AN, which means that H is a normal subgroup of AN, but AN is a simple group, so it can only H can only be one or AN. I guess that's what you want us to do, but 
I, I'm not sure, and I have no idea how to prove that. Okay, let's see. With an is an. Oh, if I can get this. Oh, and I made this too small accidentally. Okay, I can fix that later. This is good enough. Okay, so sorry, I was trying to get this, make this easy for people to see since there's still some people here and I can record this. Um, well, um, so let's let n greater than or equal to 5. H is a normal subgroup of Sn. All right, so we know that uh, H intersect An is normal in An by number something from homework six, I think, right? Oh, wait, why is it true? Uh, So, just a second. This is number, five, it follows from number five from homework six. Uh, that if, N is a normal subgroup of G, and uh, H is any subgroup of G, then N intersect H is a normal subgroup of H. So here, uh, okay, H is playing the role of N, and this is, so, so this is like, this, uh, I mean, I guess, yeah. Okay, okay. I don't know and this is pretty this. easy to prove. Yeah. Okay, so you know how to do it if you can do that, right? Yeah. yeah. So the idea is that since uh, a n is simple, uh, either h intersect a n is equal to one, or h intersect a n is equal to a n. And, uh, okay, in, in this case, you would be done, right? Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, you need to prove that uh, that H is trivial. This, this is the, the only work that you have left to do that um yeah okay thank you very much mm -hmm. any other questions Okay, well, I wasn't very quick about answering a couple questions earlier in the week on Piazza, but I will be much better about that this weekend as well. So, uh, all right, I'll go ahead and stop the recording here.